Welcome to the Global Exchange, the Barada Center for Global Business podcast, where we dive deep into the biggest trends shaping the global economy, business and policy. I'm Daniela Moy, the Associate Director for Research and Technology Initiatives. In today's inaugural episode, we're kicking off with a timely topic, tariffs and trade policy proposals from the US presidential candidates. Joining us is Mark Bush, the Carl F. Landiger Professor of International Business Diplomacy here at Georgetown University. Mark is a scholar and an expert in trade policy with sharp insights on the intersection of diplomacy, economics, and global business. We'll be breaking down what the presidential candidates are proposing, whether they can deliver on those promises, and if the policies would even work. Let's dive right in. Mark, it's great to have you here on our first episode. Great to be with you. I want to start with a big picture question. Every election season, tariffs pop up as a hot topic, but they seem to mean different things to different candidates. What exactly are the current presidential candidates proposing with their tariff plans, and what are they hoping to achieve by putting these proposals out there? It's a really key question, and we know a lot more about the former president's plans than we do about the vice president's plans. It doesn't get better than this. We have a campaign cycle right now in which Donald Trump has explained that tariff is the most beautiful word in the dictionary. And following through on that, he has proposed some really big tariffs. We don't even know how high these tariffs could go. He started out with a 10 to 20% tariff across the board, maybe higher. 60% on everything from China, maybe higher. He seems intent on getting us away from our commitments under the World Trade Organization. And there's no easy task ahead of him here in delivering on this pledge, because he will break a lot of promises mm -hmm. under US trade commitments at both the World Trade Organization and under the 14 preferential trade agreements that this country currently enjoys. This is big. But recently, in a meeting in Chicago hosted by Bloomberg, among others, he suggested that his tariffs could go an awful lot higher than that. And we should come back to that in terms of answering the part of the question that you posed, why? And one of those whys is potentially the most interesting in the eyes of voters, namely to replace some, if not all, income tax with tariff revenue, which of course is pure fantasy. In the case of the vice president, we know a lot less about her plans for tariffs. What we do know thus far is that she's not a big fan of Donald Trump's plan for an across-the-board approach. Mm -hmm. However, her administration under President Biden kept all of President Trump's tariffs in place and sprinkled some new ones on top. And you could imagine that she would be forced one way or another to deliver on some tariffs in defense of certain industrial policy ambitions, at least as a negotiating tactic. No, this is great. You, you set the stage perfectly for my follow-up question. I now would like to get into the heart of the issue, and you already started speaking to its outcomes. So even if some version of these proposals were implemented, um, and the candidates were successful in what they're proposing or hoping to propose but haven't announced yet in some cases, there's still the question of whether the tariffs would work and how they would work. So if some of these tariffs were implemented or some of these plans um, with regard to trade policy, can you dive a bit deeper on the impacts that you started to describe both here in the United States but among our trading partners as well? And you spoke to retaliation. so. How do you think key trading partners might respond, um, keeping in mind that this is not a new play or a new dynamic, but we're talking about elevating it to a whole new level of complexity and uncertainty? There's so many problems, domestic and foreign. Domestically, we don't have the bureaucracy to administer differential tariff rates for every country, ally versus adversary. But even notwithstanding that, the damage that would be done with respect to our allies would be enormous. This would be a reputational knock of unprecedented proportion. And my biggest fear is that increasingly allies would begin to turn and enjoy a separate peace in trade relations with each other and largely be very concerned given the uncertainty about dealing with the United States. 
to have turned away from our obligations at the World Trade Organization, to have undermined our commitments under our preferential trade agreements would leave us as a serious question mark on the world stage. So for all those who are speculating that all of this tariff talk is adding leverage, it may very well come up shy of that. And that with our closest trade partners, never mind with distant allies who have yet to really discover what it means to have the US turn an angry eye toward them. Canada and Mexico have been having their fill of this in recent years. It's not that long ago that the third highest peak in trade policy uncertainty here in the United States happened when President Trump threatened Mexico with additional tariffs heading into the negotiations over USMCA. Canada was shell-shocked by being hit with steel and aluminum tariffs, not least because Canada is a major supplier of aluminum to this country. We are overestimating the returns of USMCA to these countries. And to have played this one out to the extent that we are witnessing on the campaign trail may not work as planned. Yeah, I'm picking up on um, a fundamental erosion of trust in addition to a disconnect between what the numbers and the reality are portraying and, and the rhetoric. So that makes my next question a bit challenging. So now I do recognize that predicting the future is always a risky business, especially in times of heightened uncertainty. But I believe there's value in trying to map out the possibilities, which is a little bit of what we've been doing here so far. So here's a question for you, Mark. Knowing what you know so far, What's your best prediction for what a post-election future might look like in terms of trade policy? Or at least, what's the menu of possible futures that we should be thinking about? And are those possibilities ones we'd like to subscribe to? There's a little bit of good news in the sense that we're hearing that President Trump's advisors recognize the serious harm that would follow if these tariff proposals were actually implemented. The concern, however, is that they believe that some of the harm can be offset by things like better regulatory regimes domestically, as well as tax incentives, including with respect to some of the industrial policy goals that may or may not be pursued by Trump's administration were he to win. I don't see the tariffs being feasible long term. And I would have to believe that there would be some effort to tone them down or at least to make them conditional upon political concessions. However, he enjoyed tariffs in his first go round. And I don't doubt that Tariff Man is equally determined this time, if he were to win, to see through some of his deepest, darkest ambitions with respect to throwing US weight around in the global economy. And I don't suspect that the multilateral commitments of this country will be a big constraint for him until a lot of countries begin to turn on some of his ambitions with respect to decoupling from China and seeing through critical minerals, rare earths, et cetera. That will require a level of coordination that his tariff ambitions are not going to be lending themselves toward anytime soon. And the other obstacle in his efforts to roll this out would be Congress. At some point, Congress needs to claw back its tariff authority. And if the Republican Party were to prevail in terms of the Senate, which the odds are it will, and may even take the House, and there's a chance of that too, everyone's asking the following question, will they rubber stamp his ambitions? I would wager no because this would be Trump's last go round and the Republican Party has to survive after that. And I can't imagine that this is really what the party of Reagan wants to have as a legacy. And while it is rather remarkable to see Republicans turning on faith in the market to the extent that they have, or at least many of them have, this isn't going to be the kind of populist branding that is going to be conducive to future electoral victories. On the Democrats' side, what's really interesting is this convergence with the Republican populism, but for very different reasons. Kamala Harris obviously voted against USMCA. 
indicating that her vote was a reflection of the fact that she felt the deal didn't have the labor and environmental protections that she wanted. No trade agreement is a substitute stand-in for a labor deal or an environmental deal, and that's really old-style democratic thinking. However, this new angle on industrial policy is going to certainly encourage lots of questions about subsidies. The more and more she feels that she has to deliver on some of these green ambitions with things that look like subsidies, the more trouble we're going to have on the global stage. And that's going to raise the prospect of potentially protecting some of these industrial policy pursuits with tariffs or having to have that reckoning over subsidies. How her administration would handle that is going to be complicated. But what we have to keep in mind in all of this is that the tariff talk has sucked all of the oxygen out of the room. We're not talking about a lot of things that matter for growing our economy and prospering in the future with the things that America does well. Tariffs are about things that the United States doesn't do well. What we're not talking about is the United States on the offense. What we're not talking about is the US actually doing things to pry open foreign markets. What we're not doing is talking about things like digital trade from which the Biden administration pulled the US, given what the WTO is up to, shocking many, including myself, because the US has no defensive liabilities with respect to digital trade. That is all purely offense. We're not talking about intellectual property. We're not talking about what fundamentally drives the jobs that 85% of Americans have, namely services. All of this is being relegated to another day. Instead, we're all consumed with estimates about what would a tariff look like, how high would it go. The numbers are astonishing, and it's almost like we've internalize this as the new normal. We're actually having conversations about, well, what if Trump really means 50% across the board? What if it goes as high as 70%? These are remarkable discussions that we're having, and I'm bothered by how easy it's coming to us in 2024. I also think that the numbers, once we peg them down, that's one thing. What needs a lot more attention is the amount of trade policy uncertainty hovering around these estimates. We're talking as if we know the number. What is a problem in all of this is our allies, never mind our adversaries, guessing how volatile will the number be. Remember, we break our bound rates at the WTO. We've got a lot of latitude, what the WTO calls water. We've got this volatility that our trade partners have to begin to calculate into all of their guesses as to whether the US is open for business or not. So what's captivating our attention as we head into the election is what numbers they have in mind. The uncertainty about these numbers is a problem unto itself. And the fact that we're even able to have this conversation and not blush is a striking indictment of this moment. This is epic. We are talking about consciously heading our way back to Smoot Hawley. And remember, Smoot Hawley comes about at a time when their referent point was a global economy that at best was the wild, wild west. Our referent point is a 2% average applied MFN rate with a bound rate on 100% of tariff lines, not that much higher. So we're going from good to bad. Smoot Hawley was going from bad to worse. And we're talking as though there's not a lot new here. Add that to the revisionist history that we're hearing about how tariffs were great under McKinley, tariffs were great under Smoot Hawley. And our challenge is all the greater in terms of getting the word out that it's all just mythology, that none of this is true. And it will take another generation, potentially, to rediscover that what was created in the wake of World War II in 1947 was actually a pretty good way of trying to bet against a future marred by future wars and a lot of despair and poverty. And part of what has to be conveyed, not just in classrooms on this campus, but around the country more generally, is that trade has been the greatest effort at poverty relief that anyone has ever known. 
and we're about to screw it all up for a couple of swing states where we cannot bring those jobs back and we cannot revitalize manufacturing for the sake of a couple of astronomical tariffs which are never going to have any payoff. And at the end of the day, why do they do it? Because it's a lot easier to run against trade than it is to run against technology. Because to run against technology, you sound like a Luddite. But to run against trade, you get to point your finger at a foreign flag. And that we're letting them do. And that is a shame. Because this is the biggest myth-making bout with respect to tariffs in modern US history. And the fact that we actually take this conversation at face value with these estimates is truly extraordinary. Yeah, you, you bring up a lot of great points, Mark. We're getting lost in the noise. We are taking things at face value. Also, uh, again, this idea of looking at the things that are not being talked about, that we're not being consumed only by one issue and accepting things that are just being presented, but applying more of a critical lens. What I'm taking away, at least in the form of a succinct summary, is that politicians and policymakers should be mindful that there is an effective value of a tariff or a trade policy, but there's also a perceived normative value that plays a huge role in how these things play out, especially during key times such as the one we're in right now. So I want to thank you. You've shared a lot of insights and have given us much to think about. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in to this inaugural episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, subscribe, leave a review and join us next time as we delve into more complex issues shaping the global economy, business, policy and our everyday lives. Stay curious, ask tough questions, listen and engage with those around you. We look forward to sharing more insights soon here on the Global Exchange.